But it's one of those changes in the first read that makes you like, oh crap, got to pump the brakes. Listen up, Umi. This is a podcast with the most ducker. This is Forge the Narrative. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul, your host. We all about Lost Souls podcast. I'm joined by Tanya Gates. Hey, everybody. Red Powell and Adam Camilleri. Hello. No, hey. This week, we got to talk about demons. Like One of the core things about Warhammer 40,000. <laughs> one of the coolest bits as well. Like the, the Pantheon is like the cornerstone of cool. Did you say the cornerstone? The corner storm, yeah. <laughs> How poignant. There, there are so the uh, codex is up for pre order by the time you're here in this, and it is it gets some di- different things in here. Some units, of course, you know, just kind of shift around, I think. But I, it, one of the things here is that if you if you dig on the particular brand or faction, I think you're going to be pleased because it's like everything got some love. Now, Bellicor's in here, you know, people like Bellicor, and uh, you know, we'll talk about how that all got spread around. I do want to mention, I mentioned that you know talk about the mechanicum in Horus Heresy and I put together a list played you know got a game in with the mechanicum played against roll eaters and um I rolled really well so I don't know how great of a test it was <laughs> but it's basically like a you know everything that everything that got shot connected took out a a fire raptor with hunter killer missiles so I may be one of the the few people on on earth who have actually connected now it only took me, you know, what, 100 years to do it. <laughs> I am on record saying that I've hit with a 100-killer missile, and it did something. It's a beautiful day. Yeah. Should have ran out and bought a lottery ticket or something. <laughs> was this, um, so with this ad mech, was this kind of like what I'd mentioned before? Did you have the mechanical robot monster things, or, or what was what was your kind of, your list build? I did. I took a, so I, I don't have one of the ones, like the, the Magos that floats on the, the dais, so I just kind of, I took a, a combination of what I have painted that was, and so again, I don't want to claim this is like the uh, optimized list or whatever, but I took a Dominus and a Magos Prime. I took a couple of units of Thalax uh, with the weapons, with the, like the lightning guns with the uh, chain bayonets on them, and then some of the uh, the Silax Guardians, and then three armored conveyors, the Trier's armored conveyors. Those things are very good. I felt like I got a lot of use out of them they're 135 points or something each you got a couple of uh, volkite guns on them and then a twin linked like bolt gun on there and then the hunter killer missiles <laughs> they got a flare shield they got a lot going for them and they hold 22 models inside so you know pretty good times and you know, they allowed me to kind of castle up if i needed to um took a thanatar with the plasma mortar on its shoulder turns out wait wait wait, wait 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 a plasma mortar yeah, oh, yeah. it's a, it's a mm-hmm. big robot it's uh probably the size of a um like a redemptor dreadnought except it has this more p- plasma big old plasma probably i don't know the size of a 50 cent piece you know in it's, diameter on, on it. it's pretty awesome looking so like it doesn't need line of sight or what what what's the mortar part of it yeah that's it and it could fire and it's got a rule called breaching that if you roll so in the, this is something I did not actually re- realize during the course of the game because you're, you know, getting still getting used to it. But the 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 breaching rule is that if you roll a breaching, it has a number in brackets, and that number in brackets is that if on the roll to wound, if you meet or exceed that number, then you get some extra AP. So on a four plus, this thing is AP two on the wound, and it fires a large blast. <laughs> Oh, so if you roll high enough, bye bye Terminators. Yeah, AP two doing. Um, you know, you're getting a lot of hits because the the diameter of the blast, and is it, it's pretty good. And I, I enjoyed using that, especially again when you were rolling hot. <laughs> and then uh, I took a couple of Ursrax units. These are the robots with the jump packs, and they're they're close combat. The, the they're they're initiative two, which is kind of a problem, but they have a lot of wounds and a decent armor save. So. You're going to part. You're probably going to get to swing, even if you you lose out on initiative. Didn't want to be charging into Angron. Turns out I didn't have to. I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, I also took an Atropos, which is 
the knight with the, like the big well it's got the singularity cannon is what it is but it fires a really a, a really bad shot a really powerful shot and that's kind of what happened the first time i shot it immobilized the the, the dread claw on the other side of the table put a hole point on the lanerator the second time i shot it is actually has a, a a rule that every time you you shoot it you roll to see if it's like a normal shot or potentially a vortex shot or a, a shot that also hurts yourself but still fires and on the second shot, I got the vortex thing. I know I'm saying a lot of words here, but you fire a five inch large blast template and it stays on the table and becomes like a, a in, uh, it blocks line of sight. It stays on the table and hurts anything in it. But I also immobilized the lanerator on that shot. And so the lanerator basically just sat there and roasted for the next two turns oh. of the game and caused <laughs> the berserkers and Angron to have to get out and try to walk across the table to her, towards me. Oh, <laughs> and that didn't work. <laughs> That's brutal. Yeah. And then again, my opponent was rolling just miserably. It was one of those things where it did a bunch of wounds. Like, well, I guess I'll just take him on Angron because he has a four plus invulnerable save. And then proceeded oh, no. to fail all of the four plus invulnerable oh, no. saves. I saw that coming. As soon as you described, like you started yeah. describing it, it was like, yep, that's, that's just as soon As soon as you state logic, like this is the best choice because logic, dice were like, ah. Yeah, we got gotcha. you. that, mate. We got gotcha. you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I don't know. Like anybody who plays Custodes is probably like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> You start not making those four ups, you have a re- real bad time. Yeah, so a bunch of Space Marines, pretty cool. And even with the, you know, they got reactions and all kind of things to do with the dice so sorely not in their favor, they really didn't make it into close combat. So I, I think in, with the Trials conveyors, I actually even further, or I tried to limit their, uh, their the way they can come to me, you know, c- trying to avoid the Vortex Blast, their own Land Raider, and my. You know, one foot long I was conveyor. You know, he created basically bought myself an extra turn or so, and they just couldn't make it across. And you know, that was the end of that turn three. You know, maybe beginning of turn four, it was basically all over. But the shoot match, and yeah, so Admac are, are good, especially when you roll super hot and your opponent doesn't. No. <laughs> so don't take this as advice. Uh, but they got they got some neat rules, and I think the only drawback with them is that initiative. And if you can figure out the the right combination of some shots. And um, when, you know, how you engage, then you should do all right. I don't know that the Atropos is amazing, but I had one and figured why not. Didn't ever take him at all. So there's my Admech report. You got a lot of rules in there. And I think if you're if you're going to play Heresy, uh, it, you do want to spend a little time reviewing. Maybe uh, what, I, what I'm going, well, I've decided what I'm going to do. Maybe it's more for people out there is to put like sticky notes, like tab your book because the books do come with one bookmark, but you want more than that. And I think you want a quick way to index your book uh, that does not slow down the game when you're when you're trying to play. How do you guys sort of approach learning a new rule set? I am a person who kind of struggles with rules. And I think we've talked about it before, but like, what's your number one tip? You picked up a new rule set. Where do you start? Uh, My first thing is to look for the similarities rather than the differences. I look for how many things are the same to the things I already know. Like, I mean, if it's a brand new game, then, you know, you've got to start right at the beginning. But Mm -hmm. like, if it's an addition change in, you know, 40k or or fantasy, I went through, we're through one there. I look for the things that are the same. Like, oh yeah, so you still move the same amount of inches. I go through all the basics. Like, yeah, so I'm still, I still have uh, all the phases the the same. Oh, there's a new phase. Cool. I'm going to go learn about that new phase after I go through all the ones I already know and see what's see everything that's the same because I can tell you what from eighth edition to ninth edition I don't think I cracked that rule book for a while into the edition like I was playing multiple games before I needed to look something up because I just like flicked through the first time went like yep yeah, same 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 cool close it off we go um, and then you know you refer back to it when you've, you're in a position where something's obviously different but that's that's how I go and that's how I learn best. So, you know, everybody learns differently, right? Like you, someone could say, okay, we'll read the entire rule book. Uh, some people say, you know, read the, the little primer rule books that they have sometimes, like the demo books. That's just the basic rules. I kind of like, uh, especially as I was looking at things like Kill Team or some of the others, I, I like demonstrations. Um, I can, I, I'll read the rules just, but I, for me, it helps to either, I mean, really to play it. Or to see it played out a little bit so I can kind of visualize it better. And so um, for Kill Team, 
is a, a good example where Warhammer Plus, they actually have tutorial videos that show like how to play the game and they go through the different phases and, and you can do, just watch it and watch them play it. And so from there, then it was really good for me to actually play the game uh, and by doing it hands on. And I could kind of tell just because of the way the game was going. And then suddenly if I did something wrong, it was it was apparent to me after you know having played so many different games. But doing that and then being able to go back and review was was really helpful for me as far as learning a new rule set. I like to sit down with a book and just flip through, just flip back and forth. And when it gives you a, a if it, if it's one that has a page number reference, just really flipping back and forth that's, that I prefer doing with a paper book instead of the electronic versions. Yeah, I, I do much better when I have a physical book in front of me. I don't know what it is. Maybe like I need that tactile experience to learn. But digital rules are really difficult for me to uh, to actually learn from. They're okay for like refreshers once I've already had a sort of grasp with the rules, but I really, really struggle with learning from an electronic copy. I think figuring out something that makes it whatever it attaches to that sense of permanence helps speed up. Yeah. But with this, to me, I was looking. It's like, man, I'm doing a lot of flipping. Like, what is what is the, the singularity canon do? What is the vor? You know, it's got this, and I got to flip to see what's happening with vortex. I probably need some tabs in this book, and that's going to help me get faster and better. And then, you know, hopefully after a couple of times, you won't necessarily need it. But that so they, that was that was my experience with Admech. I I enjoyed playing them. It was uh, I'm sure my opponent wished that they had a, a little bit better run of it on their on their side, but you know, it's the way the dice be sometimes. I will go on record numerous times as saying that I do all my best hobby related learning in the bathroom. My rule book is usually <laughs> the library. Whichever, the, uh, the game whichever library. book I need, I, I'm I currently need to learn the most of sits next to the throne, my porcelain throne, and then I write all my best lists in the shower. Like, <laughs> so like, because I'll I'll finish you know showering and then I'll like zone out and just write a list while yeah under the water. It's I don't know. It's a mystical. <laughs> it's a mystical place for me. The bathroom. <laughs> Let's talk some demons, uh, if we can indulge ourselves and the listeners in this. Uh, so my, one of my one of my biggest gripes with the the previous demon book is how unlike greater demons greater demons felt because they felt so easy to remove you know i mean i start at the start of ninth edition there were lists where they had a bunch of keepers of secrets and they would run at you and they were really strong and then as kind of we went to the the new level of killing ability that ninth edition seems to have brought in they fell off really hard like really hard those demons just did not feel very difficult to kill at all um so i'm hopeful that the new like greater demon data sheets have all been revamped and feel good to take yeah, we can talk about some of that. Let's talk about like the detachments, like how you actually build them and maybe some things that people can include them in other armies if they so choose or other things in this. So there's the demonic allies rule with a demonic uh, pact. And, and basically, if you include, if you're the inclusion of Legion, Demonica, Agent of Chaos, Corn units in your army does not prevent World Eaters units in your army from using the rules, so on and so forth. And how you get that is that if your army includes one Legion D Demonica detachment and the combined power ratings of all the units in that detachment make up no more than 25% of your army's power level, uh, then until the end of the battle, every unit in that detachment gains the Agent of Chaos keyword. That's cool. So that's similar to what they've done with um, Brood Brothers for Gene Stealer Cult. I, that's actually quite a cool change. Yeah, I, I think that's you get, getting getting the armies into it. What is it? How does it feel like a chaos thing? Like they're mm -mm. selling the souls in the right way. Well, it would it would suck if there was no thematic way or no you know sorry rules way to represent the how thematic it is to have you know word bearers and you know demons working together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, there are some restrictions here if your army only contains Legion Demonica detachments and it includes any greater demon units. One of them must be your warlord, uh, unless it also includes Bellacor. Bellacor kind of uh, uh, trumps it. The warlord at that. Yep. Uh, for each greater demon unit included in this detachment, you can include one herald of the same allegiance keyword uh, in that detachment without the herald unit taking up a battlefield role slot. So if that's trying to get those battalions filled, gives you a little bit of uh, flexibility there. Yeah, I do, I do not mind that. Uh, so then I think one of the, it might be cool to talk about one of the biggest changes is that, um, the way the saves works, which you've seen that on the Warhammer community site. Uh, but I'd like to point out that it gets like, there's some nuance here is that the demonic invent of vulnerability 
like instead of a normal save characteristic, and that's save with the capital S, as described <laughs> in the Warhammer 40,000 book, is that each uh, Legion Demonica data sheet has a demotic save characteristic. And it goes on to say that it has one save versus shooting, one save versus, versus uh, melee, that's the slash, but it's not an invulnerable save or a save. So things that would ignore saves, like armor saves or vulnerable saves, this, need, this is neither one of those things. I, I think this is a, a huge piece. Um, they've entered in, they've inserted in a mechanic aspect that has superseded a lot of other elements of the game. And uh, I, I think that's critical. I think that's very important as you're trying to bring things in and um, make things distinct or unique, right? And and how you go about managing that. So I, I think it's really awesome that they've gone this direction with it. I know it's another level of complexity, but it's also what, you know, when you pick up demons and, and you play with them. And I think sometimes, and especially the more recent editions of demons, I think that they've blurred into a lot of other armies and how they played. Um, I, I wouldn't say that they were the most unique outside of just aesthetics to certain regards. Um, but it, it is, uh, this is a really interesting change and I, I can appreciate where they're coming from with its development. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. I think, uh, I think last week I touted the otherworldly nature and how they demons in 30 K in the previous edition felt like they didn't play by the same rules as everybody else. This feels like the 40 K extrapolation of that statement. Like they don't play by the same mechanics. They'll play by the same, you know, rule book, but they're going to be same, same, but different because they're not from the material realm. The rule book we've got was written for the material realm here at demons. They're here to do everything a little bit spicy. And uh, I'm absolutely here for it. I think it's a cool change. I think it's seen how other rules interactions are. So I think it's for demon players. If, if you're playing against an opponent and they manipulate saves, you might need to like do a little. Well, let's see what your rule says versus what my rule says, and see if that actually <laughs> yeah. matters. Well, so one of the one of the funny things uh, that a mate of mine um, said because I, I lent a I borrowed a Grey Knight army off him and I gave it back to him the other day, and he said it's going to be really funny when demons come out to see if all the the stuff in the Grey Knight's codex gets FAQ or altered to ignore demon saves now because there's a bunch of stuff in there that's supposed to ignore demon inv- invulnerable saves on demon models. Um, so if that all gets FAQ, then there's stuff. Yeah, it just it's another layer of of a bit, little bit of a meme or a little bit of joking around jesting about how many more layers of of nuance and points of difference we must have in this game but i still think it's pretty funny it's gonna be neat to see you know again just if the demons can do what they're supposed to do on the tabletop and you know there are some other abilities too they got the demonic terror which is not i don't think really a new mechanic to them but enemy units within six inches subtract one from the enemy's leadership characteristic and subtract one from any combat attrition test i think we we see that as like if you're supposed to be scary you get these neg one neg ones like as a as a thing across different codexes yeah I, i'd really i'd like to see the uh, i'm hopeful there's a way for them to leverage that mechanic um because i'm finding there's so many well morale limiting morale altering or modified mechanics in the game they just don't come up as much as i want them to so i'm hope i'm hoping they can make some mileage out of this it's tough because the leadership manipulation is it's existed in the game for what i don't know 15 years or something now is something but it's it's either not good enough or too good it seems to be real hard to find that that like perfect thing but then it also plays into the fact that like we talk a bunch about tournament list and pe- people's tournament list don't often include things that are easy manipulatable in this phase of the game it may come up a lot in more casual games well, that's exactly that's yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, custodies with their you know leadership eleven across the board, um, tyranids just not caring at all. Uh, <laughs> a bunch of single model units that are becoming quite prevalent. I mean, the best example of that being um, knights, where you've just got an army of single model units. There's no chance of a single model fleeing. It's either dead or not dead. Uh, so there are a bunch of armies that just don't f- make the morale phase matter. I suppose. And so I'm hoping they've got other ways to, to to leverage it. Like, you know, psychic abilities, warp storm abilities that say, oh, you must take a test against your leadership um, or if we roll hard on your leadership, you can't overwatch or, you know, you have movement, stuff of that ilk. Like something with, that means makes these modifiers mean more than just do you fail your morale test at the end of the turn. 
you know, so there, there are, I'm glad you brought up the warp storm. That's another big thing is that the warp storm is, is meant different things over the years, but now you, you accumulate warp storm points and at the be, so at the start of each battle round, you can make a warp storm roll to do so roll eight D six, you know, one for each point of the star, I guess. And for each four plus gain one warp storm point or WSP for short, as they have in <laughs> here. Oh, they actually put that in. I thought that was a TPM special. No, no. It's referenced. It's, it's kind of weird. Is that they go on to say one warp storm point or WSP, but then you know that you don't see that in the rest of the description. But you know that's good as uh, so. It, but it is in in the actual description of the things. Like it, it'll say five WSP, three SP. That's how they uh, denote it in the codex as when they're describing each one of the effects. And there are a couple that do this. So there's a in the there's section for each faction. Undivided, Corn, Nurgle, Zinch, Slanesh, and one of them in the undivided section is for for three warp storm points uses the effect at the start of a turn, a turn, very important, uh, until the end of the turn while the enemy unit is within range of the demonic terror ability. Uh, one or more of the units of your army sub- subtract one from the leadership characteristic of the models in that unit. So you start to see how it starts to stack up uh, for the, the leadership manipulation, you know, if it comes up. There are some, here's a five WSP thing here. The Dark Invigoration uses effect at the start of the morale phase. While one model in each Legion Demonic unit from your army can regain up to D3 lost wounds. If every model in that unit has a wound characteristic of one, uh, that unit can instead be replenished. When the unit is replenished, you can return D3 destroyed models to that unit with their full wounds remaining. Each return model no longer counts as having been destroyed for the purposes of morale test this turn. Each unit can only be replenished once per turn. That's cool. I like that a lot. Then each faction has things like a a four warp storm point for WSP. (laughs) Uh, Use this effect at the start of the fight phase until the end of the phase. Each time a Legion Demotic unit from your army makes a melee attack, add one to the attack's hit roll. So that's just um, that's just army wide, yeah. That's not that's just oh cool. My army is just a better army. Yeah. Now. Each time a legion demonic a Nurgle model from your army makes a melee attack. That's really cool. Yeah. And so they've oh, so they've got god specific traits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that's elegant. So is that oh, is that the the is that like a mono god? Like if, do you have to be of a single god to get that, or you just having no? Any it's god? if your army includes any legion demonic detachments. It's detachments. So I mean, you you mix it up or whatever. In which nice. uh, yeah. Every unit has the Nurgle keyword, so it's not the detachment has to be fully Nurgle to open it up for you. But you could have potentially multiple detachments, different gods. That's cool. That's very cool. The, it's just too bad you can't have four detachments. Yeah. <laughs> With this, uh, the warp storm stuff, there are ways in the book to gain additional warp storm points and also bank warp storm points from turn to turn. That's that's right because you're supposed to you lose them at the end of the turn, right? Unless you've got a way to bank them. Yeah, and the, and there are there are abilities in the book to, to allow to bank it. So if that's important to you, you build strategies around them. The the book allows for that to happen. Brilliant. Yeah, I do like this this next one. You know, talk a little about a little about Nurgle, and I will say as someone, I built and painted Erotagus. I did yep. not magnetize him up to be all the different <laughs> demons. So I did immediately flip to the Erotagus page and check him out. Turns out he's okay. He's pretty good, playable. Uh, so there are ways to like increase the if you're checking vehicles, which there are a lot of things, but the vehicle keyword in the rule in the rule book for two warp storm points can increase the AP of the attack by one for Nurgle, which is cool. Very important. That's, that's the thing that even, like all the way through eighth edition they always struggled with as well, right? And, and in ninth edition it's been the same. Nurgle's just just has doesn't have much AP to swing around. Lots of attacks, usually poisoning really well or having real to wound, but the AP was never there. So that's probably really important. Uh, jumping around to Slanesh, they have a lightning speed for three WSP. Use this effect in your movement or ch- or charge phase until the end of the turn. Each time an advance or roll of a charge is made for Legion Demonic Slanesh. Unit in your army, add one to the result. So getting plus one to charge for three free points. Easy money. Yeah. And, you know, talking about like learning the rules, I kind of see this as almost like an ablative command point CP total that you just kind of have on, a, on another D12. Well, it's um, it's very similar. We've seen this a couple of times now, um, ha- like units having their own like resource management bonus. I mean, the first one I think we saw was the Cabal points for T-Suns, and now we've got Fate Dice, Miracle Dice. Um, and yeah, now now these got these ones. So I'm here for it. I think it's a cool little mechanic. Yeah, I think you just see how much you know gas you get in your tank at, at each round. 
then, and then, you know, I don't think it's necessarily with eight dice on a four plus, I should say that there's going to be plenty of rounds when you don't get any WSPs, mm-hmm. you know, but uh, it seems like you could actually work into your strategy of having three or four of these and, and then, you know, bank on the plan on what you can do with them, you know, and then on the off chat, you roll five or six, then you just kind of live in those halcyon, the salad days of, of the warp storm and salad days. get to work. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> There's a uh, it's like going the corn side, just you know, spreading the love around. The overwhelming rage, start of the opponent's opponent's movement phase. Um, each time an enemy unit, excluding aircraft, with the enga- comes within engagement range of any demonic corn unit, uh, or your army units from your army is selected to fall back. On a four plus, the unit cannot fall back. Awesome, and that's just army wide. Yeah, uh, okay. of any legion demonica corn unit, they're trying to fall back. Okay. Nice. So yeah. you pick the turn, you get into like five or six different pivotal combats, and and yeah, just be like, well, run the gauntlet, see how many, see how many can fall back, mate, because one of them is going to stick. Yeah, I like that a lot. Gives a lot of agency on the planning front, because um, you you'll get to see you'll get to see how many you've got, um, or you you'll get to hold on to them in your turn. Start it. Wait, is it the start of the battle round or start of your turn? You generate them. Uh, if every unit from your army has a Legion to Monica keyword. Um, excluding models with the agents of chaos, an aligned keyword at the start of each of each battle round, you can yeah. make a warp yeah. storm roll. So you, if they're going first, you still roll. Um, yeah, you still roll immediately on the on the top of their turn every turn. So yeah, this is cool. You always know how many you've got. Um, in in their turn, your turn, you won't have to. Yeah, you won't have to plan ahead. It's, it's the best way. Sick. I like yeah. it. There's ways cool to so you can get plus one attack to everybody in the army. Like those... who would have thought? Shocked. <laughs> Which, I mean, when you take into account, I mean, blood letters went from one attack to two attacks now, and then you start bringing in all these other little things. I I think that the the corn units, very much like the world eaters, have this ability to ramp up drastically to go from this, you know, kind of, I'll say, base level of blender machine unit to really just turning it up to 11 once you stack all these different things on top of it. Uh, Zinch has got some good stuff here too. Uh, the Deluge of Fire for four WSPs increased the weapon skill. I'm sorry, Ballistic skill. Was, ballistic that, skill. was that two words or one word, that name? Uh, Deluge of Fire. <laughs> Deluge. Please tell me it's one word. Please tell me it's one word. It's all one word. It's hyphenated. No. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's a new, you it's a new take blender. Take a lose your fire. You know. Uh, sorry, continue. Um, <laughs> forget that I'm sometimes you know it's late and I'm from Georgia. <laughs> uh, rampant mutation is another one. I didn't expect to see something like this in the Zinch thing. So it's three WSP. Uh, use this effect in the fight phase until the end of the phase each time a Legion uh, Demonica Zinch. Model from your army makes a melee attack. An unmodified wound roll of six inflicts one mortal wound on the target in addition to any normal damage. Uh, the only here's the caveat here is that an enemy unit can only suffer three mortal wounds per phase. Oh, it's only three. Uh, this. But but that's each unit. Not that not that yeah. you can only do three. But it's like if you were engaged in f- you know five different units, you could dish out fifteen mortal wounds over the course of that. It's actually true. Yeah, mm-hmm. you don't. When you hear about these things, you just think your context is like a stratagem. Like this is on one unit, but this is like could possibly be army wide. Yeah, if you lined it up, I mean, it's like biggity bam here going with my this rampant mutation, and this is really good defensively. Is is uh, what I think about because you know you're playing horrors or something, and you don't want to be charged, but inevitably that will happen you're like okay you got me and now let me let me dig myself out here with this ramp beat mutation i mean we don't see a lot of charges where five units are charging you know five different units on the tabletop but you know it could happen i, I like it that these are uncapped just like you said well hmm. capped on the wounds but it's uncapped on if if the unit if your units are in the situation to take advantage of this then it could be completely army wide for you in that part that part is strong that part is very strong so let's talk about we talked about some awesome things let's talk about some things that i i don't know how long time demon players are going to take this i well and so that's something you know i mean <laughs> before we jump in let's i mean the locus right the 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 locus of uh what the last edition that's that didn't come up, right? We didn't see that one. And so, like, right out the gate, there's it's just understanding. It doesn't have to be. It's Look at Sisters, right? The transition from what we knew, like, even Sisters at release, 
of their actual codex, not talking about White Dwarf Sisters, but to the next edition of Sisters, and there's still things that have kept them on the table. And so I guess I'm I'm going with a disclaimer that a new codex, a new edition, it, the models are the same in certain regards, but the rules may very well be drastically different. And I, I think that that's okay. Uh, but I, I know how frustrating It's going to take some adjustment, right? I mean, it's it just is, one of those it things. It, there are it things. Is. And each one of these, the each one of the Pantheon's factions has a setup of, you know, it's got the kit. It has some extra points you can spend. Like the, there's exalted bloodthirsters. There's no longer like the bloodthirster of, of what is it? You know, inclement it weather. Yeah, there's... You know, yeah. Yeah, inclement weather, good. Yeah, yeah. Inclement weather, uh, mildly upset and uh, you know and, uh, slightly and perturbed. Bum tum tums. Had his fur you know. backwards. Yeah. Um. So I think what I what I was taking from what Red was saying was that maybe sometimes the change is kind of like a parallel change along the power kind of spectrum. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you're expecting to take your army, you know, right back out of the case and put it right back on the table, that's probably not going to going to happen. Uh, but, but again, maybe it will, but we'll talk about that just one second, but the kits, you know, as far as like what you get, you get some special abilities that you can, you can beef up some of your characters, you know, some of the greater demons, um, and you spend extra points the same way you you upgrade like a master of sanctity and that kind of stuff. And then each each arm or each faction has its own stratagems and its own relics and in some cases you know like psychic powers. So you you got all that stuff and so plenty of flavor in there. But where I was going with the I think one of the biggest changes are is that the demon troop squads like a bloodletter squad, a plague bearer squad, so on and so forth are capped at 10 models each. Whoa. So no more 30 demon squads. Oh, dear. And that may not be a terrible thing, but you know, one of the things that we talk about is value and efficiency of stratagems. And we were just talking about like value of how the warp storm is so cool because it's extra points that you get that you that applies to your whole army. So maybe this whole thing about, Oh no, my banner of blood only affects 10 blood letters now instead of 30 might not really be a big deal, but it's one of those changes in the first read that makes you like, Oh crap, got to pump the brakes. It's a different world. Why were people bringing big squads of troops in the demon codex anyway? Oh man. I mean, it is, not just because it was kind of iconic to the demonic horde aspect, but in gameplay wise, I mean, there was a mechanic and we go back to this, right? The mechanic has adjusted or changed. The older edition had it where if you had 20 or more models, you got an additional bonus depending on which like you had, right? So like 20 or more plague bearers were minus one to hit 20 or more blood letters were plus one to hit. And so like you were always trying to have these larger units. The book literally uh, inspired you as a someone playing the army at the time to have larger blocks of units so you could capitalize on those benefits. And now it sounds like we're going in a, I mean, same models, but a very different direction. Yeah, we'll see how that plays out, if it even, because I haven't built a, a list with this like with all the changes to figure out exactly if this, if I feel like I've got everything I need, um, you know, seeing this in his, in his final book form, you know, but it's, it's one of those to where longtime players are going to look at that and go, I, I've got to make alterations. And so I think that's a good thing though, because you can kind of look at it at, with almost like fresh eyes, knowing that things are going to be different. So red was spot on and eighth edition. There was a huge incentive to take fatty units of, of lesser demons. It was, it was real, it was a cornerstone of the last book. Um, and so remains to be seen, but I'm really hoping there's a cornerstone, like a 10 man, 10 demon, 10 demon at 10, whatever is a cornerstone of this book because it's incentivized. Um, what I would have loved to have seen, and it could be in here that I just haven't, haven't heard of yet. And I'm pretty sure I would have, if it was, um, Paul would have probably shouted it from the rooftops in that, in that same sentence. But, uh, remember, remember the, um, Drakari book when you could take 20, 20 witches yeah, but if you upgraded them, you could take 10 Blood Brides, or the same for, you know, Cabalites and Trueborn, etc., Hamoxites and Rax. 
be cool if they had something around the corner that was like, yeah, you can upgrade a unit of lesser demons to take 20 of them with some extra stuff. That would be a nice little elegant change. If there is uproar about this, you know, and GW was conscious of it, they could be like, ah, right, we'll just slot this in. Some of the the other units, I think, like, we're talking about Fiends of Slanesh here, maybe after the break. Uh, they're, they're great. Um, Adam, I think you in the pre-show, you were talking about Skull Cannon of Corn. Oh, I think the skull cannon's awesome. I think the skull cannon's phenomenal. If you want to, if you want to jump into it, yeah. Let's actually let's take a, a quick break and then we'll come back and, and talk about some of these like more elite and stuff like that. You, you. A second. FTN is brought to you by Discount Games Inc. Please visit them at www.discountgamesinc.com, and don't forget to ask Jay about ways to save even more on your hobby projects. We are back, everybody. Uh, bathing in the, the fires of the Eye of Terror. So am I the it. only? Wait, am I the only one here that doesn't really have a Chaos Army? Yeah, probably. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Adam, do you have s- Chaos? No, he oh, does. Dark he angels, has baby. Dark Angels. <laughs> oh, oh, man. <laughs> no, 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 no. You will be denied at the gate. I will gatekeep my own trader jokes. Thank you very much. Oh, man. <laughs> that was been too many. That's unscripted. Man, man. That's freaking. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I've been, oh, three and a half years of playing Dark Angels. I just got to have those boxing gloves ready to go. I just got to get that first hit in every time. Because as soon as I do, everyone stops. <laughs> but it's yourself. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know like, the I people know. don't want to beat up on the guy who just hit himself. Right? <laughs> exactly like... right. <laughs> so let's talk about the... Uh... It's actually, Sorry, it's actually part of the reason I'm playing Trader Dark Angels in Heresy. It's because everyone will just have to shut up. <laughs> 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 so going to, to Slanesh and talking a bit about that is that, you know, we talked about the smaller squad size and that demonettes, you know, it can't be, can't be 30 demonettes anymore. It's got to be 10, but they're neck two AP, you know, one on the piercing claws, one damage piece. Oh, legitimately a lot better. Uh, don't, yeah, don't hate that at all. And then fiends of Slanesh, um, their claws are neg two AP, two damage a piece. And they got four awesome. attacks piece awesome. movement 14 and, and i'm assuming like it's slanesh there's probably a way to advance and charge right they do get some abilities and i also want to talk about one of the stratagems that they have for the fiends they have melodic delirium use the stratagem at the start of your opponent's psyche phase select one fiends unit from your army until the end of the phase the unit has the following ability while an enemy psyker is within 12 inches of this unit each time a psyche test is taken for that unit subtract two from the result Subtracting two is pretty sick. Yeah, we already know. Everybody knows that one player can barely roll a seven on a good day. <laughs> I feel attacked. <laughs> <laughs> It is it is one of those to where like seven seem impossible, nines you see could do all day, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that neg two, that's you know, it's it's, it's going to be terrible, especially when it's twelve inch. Twelve inch aura is twenty. That's half the table. With one From fiend a, to Slanesh. Yeah. Well, with a, with a 14-inch move, it's just yeah 26-inch threat range on your minus two. I think that is uh, going to be some seriously bad news for a lot of players because it's not one unit. You don't target a unit with that. It's anybody within 12 inches gets that neck two for one command point. And I think that is like guaranteed expenditure if you're if you're playing. Like we we talk, you know, in some other shows about what are your must, what do you what do you save a CP in your back pocket for? And this is it. Well, you you play against T Suns and they just have every turn of the game instead of just having cast something, they have to spend a CP to cast something. That's just value. Yeah, and that also counts for like psychic actions and stuff, right? So maybe you're taking Absolutely. away points from them. Hmm? I, uh, I don't hate that ability. Yeah, I don't mind it at all. So, the Skull Cannon. You may never have heard of this model. You may never have seen this model in the flesh. Because you never had any reason to before. I think they might be cherry freaking ripe right now. Because there are 100 points at toughness 7 with 9 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable save. And their gun actually does stuff now. Have you got it there for us, Paul? Uh, yeah, and so I like the fact that you point out they're, they're basically they're 9 wounds. They don't degrade. Uh, and then being yep. on toughness 7. Uh, hitting on a three plus with a ballistic skill. The skull cannon is a forty-eight inch range weapon. D three plus three, strength eight, 
neg 2 AP, 2 damage, blast. And each time an attack is made with this weapon, the target does not receive the benefits of cover against that attack. There's the kicker. If it was just AP 2, it would be kind of, eh, it's good into some stuff, kind of bad into power armor, well, armor or contempt power armor. Um, with that ignores cover, in addition, it's actually quite good because it wounds Marines on 2s and they'll get a 4+. plus. Um, D3 plus 3 means a minimum of 4 shots, up to 6 shots as well. Bliss skill 3 plus is pretty good also. So you'll average 5 shots. Um, theoretically, should average three hits, possibly three wounds, a couple of dead space marines. But this thing is only 100 points, like I said, and it's no slouch in combat either. Oh, well, yeah, it's corn, right? It's kind of what yeah, you exactly expect. Right. Exactly you right. Do a, little, it's, do a it's, little battle. It's the same reasons that um, on, on the Thursday show, me and Paul do together. We've actually been seeing a lot more Venom crawlers pop up in um, Chaos Space Marine list because it offers a little bit of shooting, a little bit of combat for a good price point and does a little bit of, of something else as well. This is, the, this is a very comparable unit. It does a little bit of everything, and that is actually quite rare to have in a demon's army. When usually things are very specialized, horrors can only you know only shoot, bloodletters only chop, etc., etc. So having something that even functions in two phases well um, is quite rare, and I think um, quite valuable. I mean, it's it's not that it's a a juggernaut. You see what I did there? Uh, but uh, talking about corn uh, in combat. Uh, but it, I mean, the biting maw that it has, uh, attendant hellblades or whatever, they're malefic four. So we didn't talk about what Malefic does, but it basically gives them extra attacks. Yeah, Malefic 4 is how many attacks they make with that profile, yeah? Indition. Yes. Yeah, it's a cool little, cool little trick. And I'm assuming they've called it Malefic because they have rules and, and ways to buff that function, right? Yes. Uh, like your Malefic 4s become Malefic 5s. Are Malefic weapons. Such as weapon will have the ability that reads Malefic. Uh, and, the, and then a value such as 2 or 4. Each time the bearer fights, it makes a number of additional attacks with that weapon e- equal to that value. And there's some more rules, but you get the idea. Extra attacks with uh, with that weapon, so uh, not bad. The blood letters are toughness four. I can't remember if they were toughness four before. No, that's that's a change. Nah, that's they buff. were toughness three. So that is pretty good. Uh, two attack space, Which three is attacks. Actually, a buff as well. They yeah, were only and, one attack before. Uh, I know we jumped from the skull cannon to the, to the blood letters, but the the hellblade is neg three AP damage two which is pretty much where you want to be in today's world. Uh, Nick, there you go, of course, getting around armor, contempt to two damage. Cut absolutely, down space absolutely right. I'm a big fan. But please, please tell me, uh, Greater Demons, give me give me a profile worthy of, of a, a Chaos God. Sure. Well, okay, let's start. We'll, we'll, I'm here in the corn section. Let's go with a Bloodthirst here. Movement 12, 20 wounds, 8 attacks. Oof. Toughness? Uh, toughness 8. Ooh. Okay. Uh, strength 8. Okay. Uh, demonic in, save? 4-4. Four, four. So it's got a 4 in close combat and a 4 against shooting. So, wait. So it's 20 wounds, toughness 8 with a 4 plus invuln. Yeah. That's... Well, no, no, no. It does not have a 4 plus invulnerable save. <laughs> it has a 4 plus Dude. demonic save. <laughs> against shooting. Yeah. And a 4 yeah. plus demonic save against it's, close combat. It's just got a 4 plus. Um, and that's really good. That's better than a knight. Knight has, you know, 6 more wounds but has a 5 plus um, a save that you cannot change uh, and doesn't even have that save in combat so like any decent rend it, a knight is worse I believe than a bloodthirster and I mean who knows how many points a bloodthirster is but so 110 attacks, points it's got a Okay, so it's a hundred points less than a knight, possibly more durable than a knight. Okay, we're starting. We're starting to get somewhere. Um, how many attacks? Please tell me it's eight. Uh, it is eight. Yeah, all all is right with the world. Um, <laughs> give me a just give me a weapon profile. I don't care which one. Just give me one. Uh, okay, we're gonna we'll go with the lash of corn. Uh, that's the assault six. 12 inch range, like it's a little flamer kind of thing that uh, mm-hmm. it does. Uh, two damage a piece. Nice. So strength they user. come with Hellfire Breath and the Great Axe of Corn. You can sub out the Great Axe for one of the five, Blood Flail and a Lash of Corn or an Axe of Corn. Oh, so, so that's how you get your, dif- your differentiation. Instead of having yeah. your Exalted or Super Angry or, you know, woke up on the wrong side of the bed, Bloodthirster, you've got just, just different weapon options. Yeah. Yeah. And the, cool. The, yeah, they do slightly different things. The Great Axe is not, is not terrible. Uh, it's got the Mighty Strike, which times two strength, Neg 4, AP, D3 plus 3 damage. But then the Axe of Corn gives you a Mighty Strike of just D6 damage. So, you know, a little more variable there. And then it, uh, both of them have the Sweeping Profile. But the, the Sweeping Blow on the Axe of Corn, that, again, frees you up for that second hand weapon, is uh, only one damage, whereas the Mighty Strike for the Great Axe is two damage. Praise be the Sweep, the sweep Attack Profile. There was nothing quite as silly as a bloodthirster charging 10 guardsmen and having no way to kill 10. Like, just it was impossible for him to kill 10 guardsmen. It was like, it was pretty funny. But now, like, I'm, what is, is it two attacks per or three attacks per on the sweep? Uh, 
two hits each yeah, per attack. Good. Yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> Having 24 attacks would probably be too much. 16 attacks is pretty good. Seems right. I did mis- misrepresent the Lash of Corn, even though it's the 12-inch. The the Hellfire Breath is, the of course, the Flamer Weapon that hits automatically. You have to roll the hit with the, uh, the Lash of Corn. Mm. Um, I'm excited. Starboard. And, you know, I know I mentioned Rodigus, so we might, I mean, we might as well talk about Rodigus for a second, jumping to Nurgle, if, if that's okay. Uh, 24 wounds on him, toughness 9, uh, with a 5+, plus, 4+. Plus. Same Sorry, say again. What was that toughness? Nine. Nine. Uh, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy. I'm All great toughness. unclean ones have toughness nine. Fantastic. So not just rockets. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That's only a good thing. Yeah, I mean they are they're beefy. I, I think the the greater the um great greater demons kind of do what they're supposed to do. They are great. They are demons. You will see them in list now. Whereas I think they were kind of optional before, and maybe they're not auto, auto includes, but they. I don't think you'll you'll go wrong putting them in your list. Are they still real slow? Uh, the great and clean ones. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. But they. So that's something though. Like in contrast. So what? What's their movement? If you don't mind saying. Oh yeah. No. No problem. Let me get, let me get there. Uh, seven inches for the great and clean ones. Uh, I mean that's okay. So that's seven. But what's the keeper of secrets? Watch this, Tanya. This is gonna it's crazy real quick. Put me through the paces here. Sorry. Uh, no, no. It's, uh, you gotta look. tab those pages. Sixteen. Oh Boom. baby. So that's something I mean, it was in the Warhammer community articles, I think. But showing off Slanesh models and their stat lines, uh it's ridiculous. the amount of movement they have, they are fast. They're really fast. Uh, it is remarkable how quick. I mean, 16 inches on that one. It doesn't fly, so it is somewhat limited that way. But still, you go into some of the others. I mean, even the the demonettes. Um, oh, I want to say it, it's quite surprising how far these models, all these models, are going to move. In oh, demonettes move 10 inches. Ooh. 10 inches. Okay. <laughs> That's crazy. Didn't they move seven? They were. They were seven before, yeah. and. They could advance and charge before, like it was a built-in thing. I think it's a warp storm aspect now. And so, I mean, moving 10 inches, just that's bonkers. I mean, the, I think the seeker, the Seekers move 16 inches as they well. They do 16, yeah. I mean, that is a fast-moving attachment right there. Why do I feel like my husband is going to be so excited about this? He is such a like fast, aggressive play style. I think he's going to bring out all his keepers against me. Oh, no. Yeah, so lightning <laughs> speed is the warp storm thing you're, that you were mentioning. Is it uses effect in the movement or charge phase until the end? You say, oh, that's just that the plus one. Yeah, so n- not the uh, advance and charge, but I mean, um, when you move sixteen inches, do you need to advance and charge? That's a great. That's a great point. <laughs> right, right. I mean, that's that's yeah, that's absolutely a consideration. Uh, so th- there, uh, I mentioned there are ways to to buff up each of the greater demons, you know, in the same way, and um. One of them is Insatiable Onslaught, which is add two to the advance and charge rules made for the model. And that is only a 20-point upgrade. <sighs> so one of those greater demons moving, I don't know, what would we say, a thousand inches across the table, 18 <laughs> inches, and then charging with a plus two. It's going to be real hard to get away. And and that's one of the things, you know, like one of the infernal, the infernal knights that I was talking about, they, they can move 17 inches when you take a couple of wounds. You only have to take wounds for this. And they don't get a plus two to charge. And you'd already get turn one charges off on the regular. Oof. It's going to it's gonna change how people deploy. Or it should change. Or they change the second game. I'll say that. <laughs> okay, so are there any other uh, sort of little demons that got a pretty huge glow up? We know that the Beasts of Nurgle got a huge glow up because we saw that on uh, Warhammer Community. Was there anything Get else your that Beast got... Get your Beasts of Nurgle now. Like, if you don't have... <laughs> if you play Nurgle and don't have, a, like, a, a complement of a couple of different Beasts of Nurgle, I, I think that you're you're probably going to want them. And that's because if if you leave a wounded model there, it heals itself back up. And this is a seven wound model. So you could undo a lot of work. You know, getting getting through a toughness six, seven wound model with a four plus demonic save from shooting and then have that all come back is, uh, you know, could be demoralizing. You're going to have to overcommit to those to remove them. Yeah, see how many points they are a piece. And we can also talk about the play bearers because the play bearers, uh, two attacks a piece. Nice. Uh, t- two wounds a piece. Nice. Uh, not a joke. But the Beast of Nurgle are 80 points a piece. So kind of pricey, but I think worth it. Well, didn't like every single stat in their stat line get better pretty much? Uh, strength six, movement six, weapon skill four plus, 
uh, toughness six, seven wounds, six attacks, and then leadership seven if that matters, but uh, five up, four up. And then they have putrid appendages, uh, which is neg two AP, two damage. Each time an attack is made with his weapon, an unmodified hit roll of six inflicts two mortal wounds on the target, and the attack sequence ends. So mm. you get through some good burst damage. I mean, don't forget, these have six stacks piece. Um, can we also talk about how, like, that they have one of the best named rules in the game? Because the rule that they heal up any wounds that were done to them is called gooey demise. Uh, so that's pretty- when it explodes. <laughs> Grotesque regeneration yeah. is. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was like, they actually put GUI inside of a rule. This is fantastic. No, GUI demise is the, yeah, each time a model in this unit is destroyed, roll a 1d6, and on a 6 it explodes. And it's so a, funny. One mortal wound, but in three inches, yeah. So great. Yeah, the, the Plague Bearers, neg 2 AP, one damage piece, and then each unmodified hit roll of 6 automatically wounds the target, and they have two attacks of piece base. So I am playing Night Haunt in Age of Sigmar, and they all have auto wound on hits as, on hits of sixes, and it's actually really powerful. So to have that on your core troops, I think is going to be Chef's Kiss good. It does seem pretty good. And then going to the, we talked about the the corn ability to not fall back. There is a Nurgle stratagem called the Slime Trail, and select one Beast of Nurgle or Hodorka Slimex each time an enemy unit excluding aircraft with an engagement range of that unit is selected to move, roll a d6 on a 4 plus, the enemy cannot fall back this turn. Mm. Nice. Army wide, right? Uh, no, that's that's a single. Oh, single. Okay, yeah, that, that one's single. That's a stratagem. That's a command point expenditure, not the warp storm. Mm. The, uh, the, um, the, the other one was a warp storm ability. Okay. I have a question. How easy is it to bring a variety of different types? Like, can you intermix like if you take Bellacorg, it's a lot easier. <laughs> Otherwise, you're dealing with uh, just but single detachments. I think you have to. Yeah, it's just because hearing all of the units by themselves, you're thinking like, oh, well, like if I take this corn unit and I take this Slanesh unit, there's like synergy there. But in a lot of cases, you can't bring them in the same detachment, so you have to spend more command points. Is that still? Yeah. You, you it's still going it. to be a problem. Yeah, it'll it'll be some it'll be some list choices. I think I think that will be outside of a disciples list. You'll see some um, like I don't say mono builds, but some some very designed and singularly themed lists. Okay, but how much? How many points is Bellacor? Bellacor is four hundred and twenty points. I believe that to be the same as as he is currently. If someone's a Bellacor player, huh? So he's like a pretty hefty chunk of your army, but yeah, if he got he his own psychic you, powers too. He got his own tree. But if he allows you to intermingle or easily take like the different god units, and that that might be worth it. Yeah, I mean, it can, depends on what you want. I I don't know a lot of demon players that don't kind of throw in with their lot with. I'd be interested to hear from players out there that uh, do like to mix the demons or the factions in general like that. Mm-hmm. See how that goes. I'm gonna see what kind of list are built. I would, like the, when this book. I'm curious to see how players react with their armies in, when this book gets out into folks' hands. Because you know we talked about some of the changes, or at least some of the things that like might give you pause. But I believe there to be a, a fair amount in here that does interact favorably with what we see. You know, it, it, in the ranks of organized play. Specifically Slanesh. I think Slanesh is going to be really good. I mean, I, I think that we kind of saw that with Chaos Space Marines and Emperor's Children, too. And uh, I think that Slanesh just, it has that speed that I think appeals to a lot of folks. And when you consider <laughs> what Demonettes can do moving that quick, much less any of the other units, I mean, there's a lot of power that can be delivered. And, you know, you could bring in other detachments as a, a support or auxiliary, but really it's it's going to be how quick that Slanesh detachment gets to whatever you want it to across the board and then what it does with it i mean it, it's got some significant advantages i only have 10 demonettes in my collection right now it's gonna be a long time for i can just say <laughs> time time to change that up no i will stick to my nurgle that's uh mm-hmm. I, I think i i do think that you can make a compelling argument for all of these units and things like the the uh, pink horrors you know they split yeah. When we talk about units and size or whatever, horrors, you know, might be pretty appealing because you may end up with a larger unit. <laughs> I will say that I do think that if there was 30 horror units, 
that would be really hard to deal with if they just keep splitting and splitting. Wait, do you still have to pay points to split them? I don't. I don't see that as part of this. I think it just happens now. Oh, thank goodness that you can't take 30 horror units. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exploding horrors. While this unit only contains blue horrors or brimstone models, the unit cannot perform. Oh, so you can't perform actions if you only have uh, blue or, or brimstones. Mm. And it uses objective sec- or loses objective secured. And then the split. Each time an enemy unit shoots or fights after resolving the attacks, if any pink horrors, iridescent horrors, or blue horror models in this unit were destroyed as a result of those attacks, but this unit was not destroyed, make a split roll. For each destroyed model to make a split roll, roll d d6 and a 4 plus that model splits. If a pink horror or iridescent horror model for, uh, splits, you can add up to two blue horrors uh, models to this unit. This can increase the size of the unit above the starting strength and does not change the unit's power rating if a blue horror splits add one brimstone that's really interesting actually uh like the mechanic changed a lot right, i'm get. not sure how i feel about it not being a guaranteed thing because you know you gotta bring those models and just hope for the best <laughs> yeah yeah but at the same time you don't have to like you can use all your points efficiently right you don't have to save points in your army list in order to do this so i think that it's probably a parallel change I, I like it though. I think it'll be useful. Well, I know we're there's a lot to t- talk about in this book, and we have barely scratched the surface. So after it gets out there and kind of people start to to think about it, I would love to hear what what demon players we may, we may even have a demon player on the show uh, as a segment that that's d- been doing a lot of work with demons over the last couple of years uh, in the, in the tournaments, and we should see how they adapt their list. And for the hobby segment, I kind of actually like to talk about how to paint demons for a minute because they have a lot of textures that maybe people are are not familiar with painting, especially if you're going to that ethereal look of things. And I want to talk about something a little controversial about oh. this segment is that the tutorials are changing a little bit and where they might have recommended Agrax Earthshade for something. Now they're recommending one of the new paints. What paint is that? Uh so here let me bring it up with the like no longer, you know, as null and oil, like none oil doesn't do necessarily the same thing as it, as it did under in the, I actually do like it. It gives you a little bit more of a, de, a defined type stuff. But if you're going for that all over coat, then you're looking at a little bit different paints, or at least for her is what it seems like. I mean, I'm not going to say that I didn't go out and buy a whole bunch of the old washes when I heard that things were changing. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I actually think if you have an existing color scheme, then I do. It is, yeah, it's, com- it's completely uh, worth it to do that. Uh, and then things like the Agrax Earthshade and everything still exist, but it's, you know, slightly different formulas with the, uh, with the different uh, pot release that happened a little bit of uh, time ago. I think it's the Gagorax Sewer is kind of the one that's uh, that's jumping in as the uh, as the Agrax replacement. I'm just gonna say I'm just gonna uh, complain for my colorblind oh, rattling friends grime. out there. I'm sorry, rattling grime is the one I think is is uh, jumping in there as a replacement. But go ahead, sorry. I understand that they need to trademark these names, but these names don't tell our colorblind friends anything about what color is inside that pot. That's that's interesting. Yeah, you're right on that. So I'm just going to complain on behalf of all of our colorblind friends out there, which is about 25% of our male hobby friends. Um, There should be some sort of resource for them if they want to continue making these paint names that they can actually see, okay, this is a mid-tone warm brown shade something like that that should be somewhere i, I in gotta the app plug or something like in that. the app if you go into the citadel paint app you yep. can it will tell you based on like model or faction color scheme you can find the name of it what's there right but does it tell you what it is it, no it, it will it will point to the specific point on the model and say if you want to replicate this then this is the, the color that the, the pot that you get Kind of thing. Yeah, so I think, but there's there's a lot of colorblind folks who really want to get creative with their stuff, and I know a lot of them ask ask their friends or partners to like tell them what is this color, right? So that they can go and and experiment outside of like the box art. So anyway, anyway. that's cool. just I just want to put it out there, GW, if you're listening, it would be really easy to put into the app 
what the colors are. So it's just my my tip to you for accessibility. B- Basilicum gray is the like the Nolan oil sub in now uh, in the tutorials. So it's an interesting thing to get. I'm only pointing this out uh, if you're looking to replicate some of those effects that you're not getting from the new formulas. These other things seem to work in a, a similar fashion. Give you that that all over shade. So with the like plague bearers, my recipe for that, and, I'm, and I'll keep it brief, is a thonian camo shade. I haven't talked about a thon- thonian camo shade oh, in, a, such in a, a while. Great wash. And over celestial gray and a thonian camo shade, you get a grimy green brown, which is a great color for uh, plague bearers and herbal and stuff. And then you can do all the the pustules and the bubos and that kind of stuff. You know, I, I try to go with. Uh, like a, a quick base coat of the Avalon Sunset, you can build it up as bright and as angry and as you know nasty as you as you want it from that. But I like to I like to make the sores seem inflamed and angry. Like it's you, you would if you saw someone you know with with that affliction, you would want to ask them if they're okay and get them some ointment. You know, get them <laughs> get them something cooling and soothing. You know, to have you ever tried putting like a watered down purple wash over top of it? Oh yeah, the the so only in certain areas though. I li- I like yeah, yeah, the 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 way it goes, but it there's you could, with the like with doing the greater demons where there's a lot of that flesh on a gray unclean one, and maybe pro- you know I can see this going on the beast and Urgle too, where you want some variation. Purple goes real well with that. And this is a long way of saying that on the pink horrors and things that are made of just things like warp flame or whatever, the contrast paints are excellent with just mm-hmm. a little bit of thinning on them. And I don't even use the contrast medium. I use water for most of this stuff. And it makes painting the skin a breeze. You can get, I was going to say a unit of 30, but those don't exist anymore. You can get through 30 of them, three units of 10. You get your troop section locked down in an afternoon. It looks so good, honestly. Like contrast looks so good on sort of natural or fantasy kind of things. I'm not a huge fan of it on power armor personally, unless you do a lot of extra work on it. But anything that has sort of like a skin or cloth kind of texture, the contrast looks really good on. Yeah. Yeah. This, these demons, you know, with just a little bit of technique, I don't want to say talent, but a little bit of technique, you can get them tabletop ready battle ready get you those 10 points don't you know don't let that be the limiting factor it is you you can do it and the talent is is in the bottle in a lot of circumstances liquid talent yeah. well that's uh that's the show for this week yeah, again we scratched the surface a bit on the demons but uh, i think there's a lot here for aspiring chaos yeah, there's no there's no like you know one build there's no one like it it has to be this I don't think that the chaos gods are necessarily like, I'm happy to see that corn does feel like it's got some competitive edges to it. Um, it's not just automatically relegated to the back seat because it doesn't have psychic powers. So I think it's great. I think it's an awesome layout. There will be more to come. So we'll get some more demon coverage next week. It's been a pleasure talking with y'all. Adam had to run. That's why he's, he's not here with us here at the very end. Uh, but appreciate his contribution and, and Tanya and Red. Y'all as well. Thank you. We'll see y'all next week. Bye, everybody. See ya. Leave five star reviews. Like, share, subscribe. Bye, t shirt. Hit all the buttons. said but i already subscribed you better do it too